The vibration of change, that magical place where life shifts from struggle to ease, from stagnation to forward movement, from old ways of being to new ways of becoming. Yes, it can seem rather elusive to get there, but when you are in it, you feel it down to your very core, and it can positively affect everything in your life, from your relationships to your health and well-being, from your career path to your abundance, from the quality of your inner connection to the fullness of your self-expression. Here on The Christine Upchurch Show, we explore ways to get into that vibration of change with experts in the fields of consciousness, psychology, spirituality, health, healing, and science. Are you ready to step into your vibration of change? Hello, everybody. Welcome. You might be listening live here in the Seattle area on 1150 AM KKNW. You might be listening live on TransformationTalkRadio.com or, of course, on Facebook Live. You might be listening after the fact of one of the dozens of podcasts this ends up on or on my YouTube channel, wherever and whenever you're joining us from today. So grateful you're going to be here. And we're going to be talking about something that we don't often talk about in the consciousness community, a necessary ingredient, a necessary ingredient. Oh, blah, blah, blah. my cat jumped up on my lap right as we were starting, got me off kilter, a necessary ingredient for transformation that doesn't seem to be oh so spiritual, but is really, really important. Um, I'm excited about our guest today, but before I introduce her, I want to say hello to the two men behind the technology today, Jacob at TTR. Hey there, Jacob. Hey, hey, how's it going? Good. Yeah, despite the clouds, you know, I'm thinking about Arizona, dreaming about Arizona. Mm. Me too. Uh. It's kind of gloomy out there and it's kind of got me down today, but you know what? It's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's hard this time of year sometimes. And Benny, you're always chipper. So how do you do it? (laughs) Well, I was actually going to say, come on, Jacob, turn that frown upside down, little buddy. Come on, big hug. I feel better now. (laughs) Yeah, that's my boy. That's it. All right. (laughs) It's a love month, right? So we've got to, we got to love on. It is. It is. It's also a birthday month for both me and my guest. We have the same birthday, not the same birth date because. We're different ages, but um, it's that. And my goodness, nine years ago today, or on, on the first, actually, a couple of days ago, nine years ago this week was when I started my own show, the Christine Upchurch Show here on KKNW and Transformation Talk Radio. Nine years. Oh, my gosh. Well, hey, why not? Happy birthday, birthday to oh, Christine oh, and her show. Uh, <laughs> All right, that's enough. You know we don't like to continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Congrats. It's, it's funny. Yes, thank oh, you. And you're welcome. It, it's funny because my guest today is Sabrina Fritz, and she's partly the reason why I ended up doing my own show because she and I decided, hey, you know, we're sort of at this transition point in our career. We had left this organization. Um, that we worked for before as as healers and as teachers of healing and we were looking for a new gig you know something to get our message out something to kind of rebel in a new way and um, she's she convinced me to do it we did it together authenticity rising we did it for like eight or nine months it was great Uh, and then I transitioned into my own show and she transitioned into some other things but again, my guest today is Sabrina Fritz. Um, she's a certified block therapy instructor. We're gonna hear about that. She is an advocate for people who have experienced um, sex trafficking, human trafficking, as well as abusive relationships. And she's got a background herself in the abusive end of things and she'll share a little bit about. Um, she lives up on a mountaintop and she's really good at not only staying in alignment herself, but reminding us that we need to do the same in order to manifest our goals. But she's also the person that I really wanted to talk to about this topic. One of the things that I've been realizing recently is that rebellion is a very important part of our own personal, spiritual, psychological expansion. We often think of spirituality as being something where, okay, you. You look at your shadow and 
you connect with the divine and you stay centered and you surrender to what is. But there's also another piece of it where we have to rebel against all sorts of things. We're going to talk about that. And Sabrina is one of the most rebellious people I know and one of the most in alignment people I know. I'd like to welcome our guest today, Sabrina Fritz. Well, thank you, Christine. It's such a pleasure to be here to celebrate our birthday in two days early. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, talk about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, rebelliousness. Yeah. And it's it's funny because um, here I am talking about the beginning of radio and I'm like tripping over my own words and stuff. <laughs> and it's, it's one of those things where um, we start a journey and we don't know where it's going to end, don't, don't know where it's going to take us. And I want to hear a little bit about your journey, particularly as it relates to rebellion. Can you well, share with all, our see, When you were listeners. tripping up on your words, I really like that instead of the necessary ingredient, you said agreement. And I agree uh -huh. that <laughs> rebellion uh -huh. is a necessary agreement to transformation, <laughs> not just an ingredient. Um, uh -huh. You know, from well, my rebellious journey probably started way back in Catholic school. Um, that was probably the first time I stood up to authority, really, with uh, my freshman year of high school. I decided um, I wasn't going to attend confession anymore, that I didn't need to have an intermediary to tell God what I was feeling and thinking and um, uh -huh sorry for <laughs> anything like that. And so the punishment that I received, I mean, the nun wasn't really happy. Sister Teresa was not happy with me. Um, and it was not a popular opinion that I was holding, but she um, couldn't argue that I didn't have that direct connection with God that I already felt. And so my punishment was to kneel the whole time that the entire school went into confession. <laughs> oh, no. so, you know, that, but it was important for me to have that conviction that I didn't need that and so that was probably the start i mean definitely my my parents would argue it started much earlier than that my mom um swears that my favorite question as a young child was why why yeah. <laughs> you know i just kept asking why and yeah. i never really got any good answers um and so i kept pushing the boundaries at a very early age and but ultimately i think that what as an adult um because i did you know i i was rebellious against kind of the normal societal expectations of what we're supposed to do. And I knew that, you know, I wasn't gonna go to college and I wanted to just get out of school as, as soon as possible. I knew I could do whatever I wanted to do and put my mind to it. I did end up falling into that trap of um, corporate America and I became, you know, the HR manager and I had the career and I was ascending and doing all those things, paying the bills, supporting my family. Um, but it didn't, it didn't feel right. It wasn't something that brought me a lot of joy, even though I was able to, rebel against the system at that time we're talking in 2005 creating a work from home environment for myself where i only had to go into the office one day a week now if that company after a year of doing that who wanted me back in and i said no i didn't want to commute and that's when i gave my notice after 13 years working for that company am i um wow. you know and it wasn't a two-week notice it was you know let's train somebody and then i'll leave but I knew in my heart, I didn't want to continue to spend my time and energy commuting and, and being unproductive. And it wasn't calling my heart anymore. And I actually so, had that time had, you know, had the rollover accident that trained me. And, you know, I led to being trained and um, healing work where you and I met. And I'm uh -huh. so grateful for that. And that's where my heart was. I wanted to work with people and individuals and help their personal transformation as long as the, along with mine. But it was hard to be that HR manager, um, the benefits administrator, the one that was getting everyone and registered in those, the benefits, including um, health insurance, which I think is the most inaccurate description of what that is. Um, it's a whole other topic. Insurance, isn't but that it? medical yeah. insurance. Yeah. And that, and it held me, you know, those benefits and that need for security held me a long, much longer than I felt I wanted to be there. But, you know, that was the sensible thing to do. But when my, um, the CFO called me into the office that day that I was in the office and she said, you know, that the CEO wanted me back in full time, I knew I didn't want that in my life. That was not where I was in my path, in my journey. And I knew then I needed to give my notice and it was time for me to leave. Now, it took some time to change my beliefs and that programming I had from society around that insurance 
yeah. piece, you know, and, having kids. And, and so we're, we're going to talk about rebelling against beliefs. But at this point, you said you rebelled against your religion. You rebelled against your school. Um, you rebelled against corporate America saying it needs to be done this way and not that way. And, um, and you moved forward. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. And every time I did and didn't accept the what is, what was expected, um, mm -hmm. the safe, the secure, you know, that's what my sister does. That's for her, <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh -huh. not for me. Um, my life has grown exponentially. I've, I've connected with new people. I've learned new things. I've been able to impact more lives um, and make greater change in the world because of it. Now, I could have easily just stayed there in you know, my little office under the fluorescent lights eating ibuprofen like candy and mm -hmm. you know, probably been in a much better financial situation than I might be right now, according to some people. <laughs> you know? Right, right. But right. you know, I've never had a, an issue. I've, everything's always been met. All the needs have always been met and more. Mm -hmm. So it's funny because... Um... I think we've been sold a bill of goods within the new age movement about what it means to be spiritual, because I think that there are so many sort of unspoken rules. And one of them is that um, we must sort of acquiesce. Okay. We can set boundaries, but it's, it's about um, staying centered. It's about observation. It's about neutrality. It's about detachment. It's about healing our wounds. And yet, to me, it's not just about like setting boundaries and, and allowing things to come in and just even giving, you know, loving things out. It's also about pushing back because if we don't push back, then we aren't breaking through our belief systems we're not breaking through societal structures. We're not breaking through the collective consciousness, which to me seems really, really important right now. I agree. It's extremely important, especially as an advocate for survivors of violence and um, domestic violence, sex assault. Um, you know, I was meeting with the DA this morning in a case, and that's you know, we're, we're stuck in the confines of what the law will allow and, you know, statutes and things like that. And un no one's ever going to get justice. And that's what's hard for these victims that to go up against a system that is determined to continue to re-victimize them. And it's like, how do you stand up without getting hurt more, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and, and finding that courage to do so, knowing that ultimately, you're going to be a target when you do, but you have to, you know, because your convictions, your voice is so important to be heard. And that's mm -hmm. the only way that we can get change. That's the only way we can make legislative change. You know, honestly, I could t share stories with you and your audience that would probably um, shock you into what goes on in today's judicial system for victims. Mm -hmm. And yet we're stuck with it because there hasn't been any real force coming up and saying this is unacceptable and we aren't going to stand for it anymore we really need to make a change and if it's just one person at a time that's what I'm going to do and I think about what's been going on up in Canada and at the northern border of the United States with the truckers protesting the government saying this is what you have to put in your body or else you don't get to be a trucker you don't need to get to cross the border and it's to me, what's going on is something that is um, absolutely rebellious, right? Um, and it is saying the system is broken if this is what you're saying that we as individuals need to do, if that we as a whole collective have to do, and we need to change the system. So it's really a, a, a macrocosm of the same sort of thing that you're talking about. And there are strength in numbers. And I believe that. And I love seeing mm -hmm. what's happening. I love seeing people come together um, for medical freedom and you know personal choice. People who have also chosen to have the shots injected into them are standing up for other people's yes. rights. Yes. And that's the way it should be. It should be a personal choice, just like anything in life should always come down to a personal choice. Otherwise, mm -hmm. as I can tell you as an advocate, the behavior of the government is very oppressive and very much a, a perpetrator and power and control behavior. And if we don't stand up and our voices are silenced, then we all know what happened back in the 20s and 30s in Germany, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And 
it's the sort of thing where um, the rebellion, it, it, it's almost like it goes from sort of setting boundaries, okay? Like if we're, if we're sovereign individuals and we set the boundaries in whatever way we see it is important. Um, and then this oppression comes through and says, oh, you need to be controlled for the sake of others, or you need to be controlled because we say so. And to me, that's, we can't just sort of acquiesce to that and allow, it's like, we set our own boundaries and I believe we can set our own energetic boundaries. We can set our own, you know, physical boundaries. Um, but as a collective, it's not going to change unless we push back in one way or another. And it doesn't mean it has to be in, in any way violent. No. It's, it's really a matter of saying no more and you work for us. Why are you telling us what we have to do? Um, that there's some things that are very broken about the system. And to me, it's that part of the rebellious process is the illumination of about where boundaries have been crossed and, and where they need to be fixed. And having that illumination is critical. And unfortunately, I feel like if, unless if you connect within and can feel your own personal power and that you actually do have power and you do have the right to make decisions regardless of what mandates might be in place and so forth, mm -hmm. then you know, you're going to actually affect a bigger change. So many people, this is the issue that I find, I find this with a lot of my clients and my advocacy work, they believe that if you follow the rules, that makes you a good person. Mm. Oh, so Talk many of trap. us have felt that way. <laughs> yeah, and, and I know that with your upbringing, you were rebelling from a young age. And for me, I was a, sort of a closet rebeller for a long time, but I tried really hard to be a good girl. I tried really hard to follow the rules, to play the game, um, to stay in the dysfunctional marriage, to be that, that, that good person who was following the authoritarian or the authorities dictates, which are in some cases authoritarian and not just, you know, following the rules so you don't like, you know, kill somebody, but, um, and it's, it's very, very freeing to finally rebel very liberating as it is like pulling your bra <laughs> <laughs> which I promise I won't do on camera guys. <laughs> well I could nobody would know and so <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> you know, it is so liberating it's like taking um the pillow off of your face it's like breathing air for the first time it's like oh my gosh every cell in your body just comes alive it does it does and it's what other things I think when, as we start to realize that boundaries have been crossed and we are rebelling against them. And by the way, folks, I did want to back up for a minute. Regarding the truckers up in Canada and the Northern border of the US, if you are only following this on mainstream media, you are not getting the story. Um, I am shocked to see, like I, I see dozens of videos um, every single day come across, you know, my, my account. And it's like, whoa, look at this inspiring thing, people cheering at overpass, you know, next overpass and the next overpass, all the way from British Columbia, all the way to Ottawa, looking at the, look at the farmers coming on their tractors in sub-zero temperature, you know, like, it's just, it's amazing, these people feeding each other, these people feeding the homeless, these people picking up trash, um, it is, and staying very, very peaceful, so it, you know, hearing that it's, so oh, the Russians are involved, and you know, it's fringe and all this stuff. It's like, you know, it's, it's really illuminating not only some of the authoritarian control that I believe needs to be eliminated, but it's also illuminating how the media lies. And they don't lie about everything, mind you, but they lie about quite a few things or manipulate, you know, and so it's really like part of rebelling against one thing or another in our lives as we do it as sovereign individuals setting boundaries and saying no to something is realizing that there's a whole lot more we should be rebelling against. And uh, I know I 
I lost my train of thought, but I did want to point that out to people because we're talking about the we're talking about the trucker protests, and uh, there are people who are totally misinformed about it. Well, there is a lot of you know um, that happening, and as you know, I've been a rebel. I turned off the news. 2005. I mean, a lot of things uh-huh. changed in 2005. You know? um, and I'm grateful for that. And so I don't get fed the, um, what I, what I do refer to as big pharma's media, um, because I know it's, it's bought, it's bought and paid for by mm-hmm. their sponsors. Um, and we all should be leery about, you know, if you just ever want to know who's sponsoring the information you're receiving, just look at the advertisements in between the commercial break. And I, yeah. I don't watch it, but I can guarantee there's multiple pharmaceutical drugs in those broadcasts and you need it. I mean, if I watched the news, I'd be drugged too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would, that's the only way I could survive. And you know, you know me, I, I, I live on top of Mount, like you said, and that's because I like trees more than people. Um, they're, they're just, it's more healing. It's a, it's a good environment, but I can't rebel too much from my mountaintop. So I do come down and I do work with in parameters that I feel like I can um, influence change, which I know, you know, small ripple effects do make greater ones, um, overall. And that's what we all should be doing. If it seems too, um, over, overwhelming and you know there's a lot of fear associated with stepping out and stepping when you step out of line you become a target you you know the, mm-hmm. the light is on you and so then you have to be prepared to stand in that power and and own your own truth and be yeah. able to take the the um well the punishment that comes from doing that because people get really uncomfortable when you st- step out of line because yeah. that they don't know what to do then, you know, well, am I supposed to step out of line with you or do I need to get you back into line? Because I don't know, you know, and it just really confuses people, but it does make mm-hmm. you a target. If you put your voice out there enough that it does make people uncomfortable if it goes against their already pre-programmed beliefs. And that's sad to me. It's sad to not question again, why, why, you know, I, and I have to tell you, I'm so rebellious. I refuse to get COVID no matter how many times I'm exposed to it, including this past week with my husband who got it and didn't show symptoms until, um, you know, after we were in the bedroom together and we don't practice social distancing or masks usually in our bedroom place. So, you know, <laughs> we were just completely wild, but yet still I'm no symptoms and negative. And that's just because COVID doesn't exist in my world. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. What I, and I'm not a denier, what I am saying is it does not exist in my world and I can own that and believe that and know it, every fiber of my being. No, and I've been exposed multiple times, but I will not have COVID because it does not exist in my world, in my world, in my body. And yeah, so- that, that, That's an interesting uh, version of sovereignty that um, you are whole and self-defined and self-determined and and, so you don't have to accept aspects of the es- external reality controlling you in any any way, shape, or form. Well, and fear. If I would have had any kind of fear as soon as he started demonstrating symptoms, uh-huh. knowing you know that he had COVID before a test, more than likely, then yes, I could have easily attracted symptoms and that virus. But I didn't have any fear around it, even though mm-hmm. you know we weren't practicing all those things that we were told we're supposed to. Mm-hmm. And you have to understand, I am not a hand sanitizer. I'm not a sanitizer. I, I yeah. have chemical sensitivities. I, I have a non-toxic household, which means Lysol is banned from my yes. household. Mine too. Um, I would never put anything that causes, you know, has carcinogens in it in my home. And um, yeah, so not taking any practices. I'm not going behind him. I'm not, you know, and, it's, and he's free just to be himself. And that's good. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing. It's like, we all are, masters of our reality and creators of it and I can tell you when I think about getting sick it just doesn't feel good so I just choose not to Mm -hmm. and you live a fairly clean life and I think what happens sometimes and this is sort of the um, the Chinese medicine perspective and that is if you do get sick it is the virus coming to help eliminate toxins from your system. There's an imbalance and there needs to be a clearing. And I don't think you have to get to that point, but if you do, it's not because you have succumbed and been victimized by this thing, but rather it is working in concert with you. Mm -hmm. And if you approach it like, okay, well, this is telling me to sit down and drink plenty of fluids 
and you know take some supplements and drink some some broth you know whatever it is i need tlc and i need to get my body back into balance and yes i know it can get to scary situations i am not trying to to deny no. that it can be difficult um but i also think that we shouldn't view it as the enemy because if we do get it then there is something to be processed from it there's something to be um you know allowed a as we transform whether it's eliminating physical toxins you know coming back to this this notion of of um we need to more self-care surrendering to what is you know there, there can be all sorts of lessons from it and benefits from it too so it's it doesn't necessarily have to be all bad no, my husband's really happy he got it. Now he's going to have natural, you know, immune system and his you know, immunity towards it. And they, so he's, he was actually relieved to see that it wasn't a big deal. And you're right. There are plenty of people. And I know some that have had major reactions to the virus mm -hmm. and it's very unfortunate, but yeah. you're right. I also, you know, I invest in my well being, and that's that rebelliousness, leaving a system that told me I needed to have this health insurance and knowing that, you know, with my husband self-employed and then me self-employed and paying 10 grand a year at the time, Mm -hmm. wasn't really something I wanted to invest in that I could use those resources to invest in our well-being instead I did that so mm -hmm. the result is not having to need have had any need for medical treatment for over 15 years now um and wow. I do you know but I have that far infrared sauna you know I do supplements um I make I check I did check my vitamin d level so there was some help with the medical system I got recently just to make sure my vitamin D was at a healthy level and I found out it wasn't. So I increased the amount of supplements I was taking to address yeah. that. Yeah. So yeah, and we all have that ability, the body's innate ability and intelligence to heal itself is unmatched. It is, it is. And if we get sick, we haven't done something wrong per se. It's just a part of our journey. Yeah. And I think back to, um, decades ago when I got the early stages of cancer, lymphoma, um, and doctors didn't, conventional medical doctors didn't have anything to offer at the time, which sort of put me into this holding pattern. And there I was looking at the literature, hearing what the doctors had to say, and thinking, my life's going to be shortened. Um, it can, it's going to unfold in a really disturbingly, you know, unpleasant way. Uh, how long can I hold this off kind of thing? And then I realized this is a belief system that I need to rebel against. And it wasn't rebelling against the external world so much, although I did really get a kick out of rebelling against the doctor who said, oh, it looks like it's getting worse. I intuitively knew it was getting better. And the pathologist said, oh, the cancer is less evident now. But um, it was really rebelling against uh, my internal beliefs about being a victim to my body, being a victim to the external world, um, you know, sort of riding into the medical system with some authority taking responsibility for me. I mean, it was like, I realized I've got to rebel against this, that, that whole model. I've got to rebel against my, my own personal victimization, you know, uh, sort of psyche, the imprint, that programming. And I had to rebel against the approach because they said, oh, well, we'll biopsy you every month. Well, you know, that meant a chunk of flesh out, you know, for two weeks every month. And it's like, no, I'm not going to allow that. And um, they said, don't do anything because we want to see what this turns into. And I'm thinking, I'm going to do everything I can, you know, meditation, visualization, getting some sunlight, uh, like on and on and on and on. I did all sorts of things. And lo and behold, and then the last thing I did was I chose to move across the country. And within three weeks of moving across the country and leaving my doctoral program, and I was this close to getting my doctorate, all the lesions disappeared. So it was like the, the rebellion was less against the medical system and more against my belief system that had bought into all this stuff. Yeah, I remember you even sharing that, you know, you were going to get that doctorate even if it kills you. Yeah. Yeah. And I realized it was, I realized it was. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it was this great, um, it was this great experience because it taught me so much about my own beliefs. And in fact, 
when I found out about having the early stages of this, one of the things I chose not to do for the first year was to tell anybody in my family because I knew that their belief systems were going to infect my belief systems, reinforce my upbringing's programming that I wanted to avoid because I wanted to explore a different version of reality, a, a different set of beliefs. Um, and so it was, it was very helpful for me on my journey. And of course, you know, I, it, I ultimately became a healer because of it, but, um, yeah, it was, there was rebellion after rebellion after rebellion, and it wasn't easy. Not easy, but it paid off really well. Yeah, it did. It did. So <sighs> during the last couple of years, um, no, I, I'm going to back up. First of all, you're talking about how you've avoided the news. And I had done the same thing for probably more than a decade, unless something big happened. I remember I was down in um, Tucson when the tsunami in Japan hit. And um, I was down there to be evaluated to, to, for this experiment um, to see the effects of healing on range of motion. It was, you know, so I was like immersed in that. And then when I was walking through the hotel lobby and saw the stuff about the tsunami, it's like I paid some attention to that. So there were moments along the way where I paid attention. And I would learn enough about issues to vote and, and those sorts of things. But I really stayed away from the news. And then in 2017, early 2017, my guide said, pay very close attention to the news. And I'm thinking, what's this about, right? And, and so I did. And I got into mainstream media in the, 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 you know, the party, the, the tribe that I, I thought I belonged to. And I bought so much of it, hook, line, and sinker. And during the, during the commercials, all those pharmaceutical commercials, I'd say, blah, 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 you know, where I fast forward through them, that sort of thing. But, um, and then I realized when the, the health issue was coming up, wait a minute, what they're saying, it's not based on the data. It's not based on those studies. I've looked into these things, you know, research statistician, you know, I, I know what you can say about data. It's like, wait a minute, that contradicts that study. And that, you know, the, the person who's actually saying it is contradicting himself. And like, I, it opened my eyes and, and I started diving into a different version of the news, right? A broader version of the news. And, you know, there's, there's all sorts of stuff out there, but rebelling against the system, I think, on a grand scale right now is an important part of our transformation. Well, and you see that happening in the unsponsored news that's out mm -hmm. there and the, the, the doctors, the researchers and the scientists who are sharing the information and the studies that they've done, who have nothing to gain and absolutely everything to lose yes. by speaking out. Again, again stepping out of line, you're just setting yourself up as a target to be annihilated, you know, mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's hard. It's, it takes a lot of courage to find your voice and to mm -hmm. speak against the, um, the socially acceptable norm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting. There was one doctor in particular um, who was presenting on stage about her findings of of what's in these things, you know, she's looked at them under the microscope. And she said that she's let, she let go of her house, she let go of her job, she let go of all these things that had defined her because she has become a target, one of many, many targets. So oh, there's so many out there. If you think they're just like fringe, there's a huge number of people who are like screaming from the rooftops about this stuff. But anyway, she said that she's never been happier. She's on purpose right now, on her purpose her path and she's let go of her attachment to all sorts of things in order to come forward and play her role and i'm glad you know that she's recognizing that she's happier with that and she's risking her life Absolutely. her life is at risk yet she's happier than she's ever been and i think if, you know i it's yeah i'm sure there's been at least one lifetime that i you know i know of at least one where i was buried alive for speaking out against an authority the church mm -hmm. government slash government at the time and you know that's again that's what they want they want to control people through fear because fear is um the ultimate enemy really fear mm -hmm. is the ultimate enemy if 
we could just learn that fear, you know, while the actual fear in our body that lets us know when there's a threat and kicks in fight and flight and mm -hmm. brings the adrenaline in and makes it so that you can survive an attack, an immediate sure. attack, that's great. But what happens is in our society, we don't have, it's not like the hunter gatherer days where you have the threat and then you come back and you shake it off, you know, like the animals do. You can watch animals, the prey, if the prey gets away, once it can, it shakes, it shakes its whole body, gets its central nervous system rebooted and gets back into alignment. And then it's done and it forgets mm -hmm. about the predator and it just moves on. This doesn't happen to humans because we continue to stay in this fight flight. And that's why I work with trauma survivors and I help them address the unresolved trauma that's staying in their cells. And I guarantee if you're watching mainstream news, you are a trauma survivor. You cannot not be because yeah. that is so traumatizing to listen to what they're saying. And it does impact you on a physiological. There is shown if there's studies that show trauma, unresolved trauma will lead to chronic disease, obesity, depression, and a decreased lifespan. Do we all know that, wow. you know, the, the generation Z is projected to live a shorter lifespan than their parents for the first time. And why is that? It's because our food supply is crap. There's so many chemical mm -hmm. and environmental toxins. They're born with screens in their neck or in their hands and they have mm -hmm. scoliosis. And, and they're getting the Dowinger's hump that you're supposed to get when you're 80 years old, not mm -hmm. when you're 18. Yeah, and the and type so two diabetes every, at age 15, as opposed to at age 75. Exactly, exactly. And so it, it saddens me to imagine that, you know, my grandchildren are not going to live as long or as healthy of a life that I have been afforded to live. Unless if we start to make some serious changes and recognize that we can do so, we can take that power back in our own personal health and well being. I, I, and I love the fact that you said power because that's a, a really important aspect of rebellion and rebellion doesn't have to look like uh, violent pushback it doesn't even have to look like marching in the streets it can be how you spend your money at the grocery store mm -hmm. it can be um, what you say no to who you interact with uh, which tribe so to speak, you associate with, whether we're talking about political or medical, or even, you know, who you hang out with and what kind of, of things they like to talk about. Is it a bunch of negative stuff or is it, you know, is it something that empowers you in a new way, makes you feel good about who you are, the best of who you are. So it's, yeah, it, it, we, we need to step into our power and part of that is rebelling against what isn't serving. Exactly. Identifying what isn't serving and simply choosing not to engage or play with it. And it's just that, it's really that simple. And, yeah. you know, um, we own a family business. Um, it currently is in a county that still has some mandates here in Colorado. But when those mandates came back in, we didn't implement them at our business. Mm -hmm. um, and I've shared that with some people and they're like, oh my God, well, you know, you can get fined. I'm like, so, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> ooh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Does that make me a bad person? If I get fined for not doing something that I don't believe in, because mm -hmm. I can guarantee, you know, I've had one or two speeding tickets <laughs> in my life. Only, only, <laughs> only, oh, that's all I'll confess to <laughs> And I do on the check, I write in the memo donation, you know, I just look, okay, I've given the county some money. <laughs> and, and there's that little victim's comp. And I look at that, you know, when I'm serving my survivors, I'm like, and, and I can access some victim's comp funds. I'm like, I've already paid into it. Let's just get some of that money back, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, but they, we have to take a stand. I mean, I would much rather die for my convictions and standing up for what I believe in and then to live a life of conformity. I mean, I can't think of anything more boring and more yeah. slow death than anything. Yeah, it, it's to me that that goes against the soul. And it yeah. doesn't mean that there aren't some things that our soul tells us we should conform with, right? Um, I don't kill people. Yeah. People deserve it. 
I've been provoked. <laughs> I'd like to. <laughs> I really would, but yeah. I don't. That is a line I don't cross. <laughs> right. And I think that one of the most difficult things about the rebellion, as we sort of break through our belief systems and push forth based on our soul's connection into human form, we can find that we suddenly don't connect with or, you know, the, the, the tribe that we've been associated with. And it might be a political party. You know, it, it might be um, our neighborhood community. It, you know, it might be our family. And it's sometimes really difficult to say, this is, this is a tribe that I've felt connected to for all these years that I've you know, voted with, or I've done potlucks with, or, you know, whatever it is. And it no longer is in alignment with who I am. And that can be a really disorienting thing. And I know that there are plenty of people who are sort of, I consider them to be a part of the new age movement, the consciousness movement, whatever you want to call it. And they have felt very much in alignment with certain political parties, certain, you know, political aims. And they've come to recognize that, oh goodness, there are ways in which that tribe of mine is going against my sovereignty, going against my personal beliefs. And it can be incredibly disorienting. Same thing with family members. It's like, you know, you, you want to be accepted. And yet, what happens if that acceptance comes at a price of, of denying a part of yourself? And that often happens. And it takes me back to when um, years ago, when I was in an abusive marriage, I, alcohol was my escape to numb, to not deal with what was going on. Um, and it was becoming a problem. And I knew it was becoming a problem. So when I wanted to go to AA, I went to a coworker who I know was in AA because it was before internet, you know, it was, always, you know, we had the phone yeah. books and it's like, where are the meetings, you know, and they have a meeting list, you know, and all this. And, and I remember the words that she shared with me was at that time, you can't play on the same playground anymore. Mm. And so what she meant was if I was going to make this lifestyle change where alcohol was no longer going to be a part of my life, I couldn't still have the same friends and the same lifestyle that I had before, because I would continue yeah. to be tempted and probably not be successful in my desire to not drink. And I think that's the way it is with, you know, it was just like when my heart was calling me to facilitate healings and I had this nice cushy job that I was able to do easily from home. And then when they wanted me back in the office, well, I knew I wasn't willing to make that compromise. Then it was time for me to leave that playground. And it was scary. Mm -hmm. It was terrifying. Yeah. It was absolutely terrifying. Um, but the rewards were so beneficial financially, mm -hmm physically, emotionally, and spiritually, you know, um, and I wouldn't have been able to have the experiences I had in my life if I hadn't found the courage to do that. And so, yeah, it's hard, you know, I learned, and I've shared this with you years and years ago, that every relationship has an expiration date. And that's a really mm -hmm. hard thing to accept. You know, sometimes yeah. it goes to death. Sometimes it's much earlier. And when you talk about family, it's been really challenging for me because my beliefs and my big voice has definitely caused a rift with me and my eldest daughter. I haven't been able to see my granddaughter and she mm -hmm. is the light of the world. You know, she, the, the world spins as far as I'm concerned because of her. Now it could be easier for me to acquiesce and to, you know, just placate people and to go against my beliefs mm -hmm. to please others. And I've known others. I've known other people my age who acquiesced to, getting things into them that they didn't want just to please family members. And I'm not yeah. willing to risk my health and well-being for that. Mm -hmm. I just can't do that because I do believe that there would be a risk to my health and well-being mm -hmm. if I did that. Cause right now, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know, and I, mm -hmm. I take very good care of myself and um, make sure that I will only need medical treatment in an acute injury or infection phase, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's not easy. It's not easy. And we do, we lose some friendships, but ultimately 
you know, you have to ask, were they friends to begin with then? And, and mm-hmm. it's okay. It's okay to call the herd. <laughs> you, know, it's, you don't need yeah. everybody to like you and to stand up with you. And there's never a crowd on the leading edge, is there? There's never no. a crowd on the leading edge. No, there's not. There's absolutely not. That's a great point. And I love this concept of leaving the playground because one of the things I've learned over time is that you leave one playground, eventually you find another playground Mm -hmm. that's more fun, you know, and then you leave a playground again and you might feel like, oh, I'm not having as much fun. I don't have as many playmates. And then you find your way to yet another playground. And it's like, oh, wow, there's so many more things we can do on this playground. And and it's more fulfilling on this playground. Mm -hmm. And that's it. I mean, you know, we know if we hold on too tightly or cling too tightly to what is, we're not allowing what can be. And I've yeah. always wanted to see what could be, what, what else is possible? What else is available? There's, mm-hmm. you know, just because complacency, you know, contentment is not, contentment is overrated. I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people would just like to be content in their life. And I understand yeah. that, but I think it's overrated because it's, bo- it's, again, it's boring. Unless if your only entertainment is a screen in front of you, you know, mm-hmm. if you're not living your life anyway, you're just living vicariously through the information you receive. And I remember this, we had a conversation a few weeks ago and this little bright epiphany came through that we're all a product of our, the information we consume. That's it. We're, we are a byproduct of the information we receive and everything is information. You know, mm-hmm. everything is information. It's how we interpret things that it and how it resonates then with us and what we hold on to determines on how it manifests in our life. But everything is information and we are definitely a product of the information we're consuming, just like we are a byproduct of the food we consume and the products mm-hmm. we put on our skin. And, you know, I, I just, you know, when I see the one where it's like, why would you question the ingredients and in something that's scientifically proven when you don't question what's in your, you know, deodorant and your face cream? It's like, yes, I do question it. And then my shampoo, uh-huh. that's why I don't use those things. That's right, why, right. I use, you know, other things that don't have all the parabens and the carcinogens in it and things like that, because I want to be as healthy as I can be. And I'm, as an informed consumer, it goes back to what you were saying. It's like, we vote with our dollars. That's yeah. how we can rebel, you know, um, I'm not very popular with my parents because I rebel against Nestle. You know, I think Nestle is one of the worst corporations, most evil corporations out there in the world and what they're doing on the planet. And I grew up with, you know, Nesquik chocolate milk, you know, and it was my favorite. And I had my kids on it, you know, (laughs) and my dad is, you know, going to be stored in his body in a Toll House cookie, you know, can. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, but yeah, it's like Nestle, no, don't, don't, you know, I will not, and I have a hard time not opening my mouth when I see somebody with their pure life bottle that you get from McDonald's and wherever, because, you know, they're infiltrated everywhere. I mean, you can't go to the Midwest and get any other kind of water, you know, and that's sad because, you know, do you really think water is a privilege and not a right? I I And that's that's what the CEO has said. Yeah, that is what the CEO has said. And I don't believe that. I don't believe, I think people should have the right to clean, pure drinking water, period. And, you know, one of the things that I've come to realize is that um, with my own personal rebellion, my own, sometimes it's professional rebellion, but it's, it's always a rebellion against an existing belief system I've had or an external belief system that I've never bought into. Um, I am vocal in some ways, but with certain people, I just back off. And with, with you know, certain family members, it's like, well, we're just going to agree to disagree. And I respect people choosing their path. Um, but, you know, I, I don't need to, to validate their path. I also don't necessarily need to challenge it. I think that some people really are thirsty for having their minds opened. Um, and unfortunately, it's, you know, the, there's so much information out there, but it's not just about the information. It's about how it's been imprinted upon us, within us, on an emotional level, because that creates the programmed pattern. So um, there, it's interesting to see how people are just like have this religious sort of orthodoxy about, you know, the existing narrative. And that if you just even bring something up about how it's, you know, it should be challenged or questioned, um, how they just, 
they get totally off kilter about it. And, you know, I've seen so many people on, on Twitter and, and other social media basically saying, I hope these people who made that choice die, you know? Uh, I hope they have their children taken away. Like, it's just shocking to see how off kilter people can get. And, it, and that programming is more than information. It is a, is a programming to um, believe like you believe, like you have faith in God. It's like, but have faith in our version of science, have faith in this narrative. Uh, and for those people, there's nothing I can do, no information I can provide, no links I can provide for them um, that will affect how they believe because it's imprinted in them on, a, on an energetic level. Right, and you're a threat to them because you are mm -hmm. you know, threatening their belief, their programming, and they have also you know, have the belief that they need to eradicate any threat to that. Mm -hmm. And it's sad, and again, that just comes from a place of fear when we can't you know, look at, everyone has their, their path, their choice. You know, there's no one path one spiritual path, one pathway to your creator, there's multiple paths, mm -hmm. you know, and they're all just as equal and important as the next one. Um, but, you know, when you question somebody's belief, it's very challenging for them to not have a defense reaction, a defensive yeah. reaction. Yeah. Um, and some are just so ingrained that, you know, you're right. You can, you can give them all the evidence and they're blind to it. They cannot see it. And this is unfortunate mm -hmm. because these are very, what I would consider, well, intelligent, or at least they have the certificate hanging on their wall to show their intelligence. Some of them and, are very intelligent and, yeah, and, and yet educated, totally unwilling. Mm -hmm. And yet just block down and shut down when, you know, you present them with facts and, and statistics mm -hmm that are undeniable, they will find a way to discredit it because it's just so threatening to who they are as an individual. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they can't, they can't imagine, but you know, how many people, you know, are going to actually, when I think more information is brought to light and maybe some of that information actually does start to get more on mainstream media. Um, if people are going to recognize, you know, recognize that they've been duped, you know, the, mm -hmm. and, and, that's not um, that's not easy to admit. It actually right. takes a lot of courage to admit that you've been um, tricked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, know, and the I, consequences. I that, as a survivor of domestic violence, you know, it took a lot for me to finally start sharing what was happening. Mm -hmm. At the time, I couldn't do it. It was too embarrassing. It was too shameful. Right. Yeah, and I think that there's been such gaslighting, and it's been done in. Um, very manipulative, but very sophisticated ways. Uh, some of it not so sophisticated, but it's it's uh, to realize that we have been malleable to the manipulation um, is a hard thing to accept. Uh, and you know, I just want to bring this back to if we're going to expand, it's it's really really important that we're willing to question our beliefs, that we're willing to let go of our attachment to them, which is not an easy thing. And then to rebel against the, the structure of the programming within us in order to go to that next level of awareness, that next level of connection, um, it just feels so important. And we're running out of time. I wanna make sure that our viewers and listeners know how they can connect with you. Um, what's your website? Website is sabrinafritz.com. That's S-A-B-R-I-N-A, F-R-I-T-T-S. But if you do the traditional F-R-I-T-Z, you'll still find me. <laughs> okay, great, great. Final message in, a, in about a minute. Oh my gosh, in a minute. That's the hard part. You know, honor yourself. Um, question your beliefs. Be willing to accept something new and the gifts that that brings when you find the courage to pursue it. Mm, I love that. I love that. All right, so first of all, I wanna thank you for joining me here today. Um, I love our conversations. When I was thinking about the importance of rebellion, you were top of the list, because uh, <laughs> you've taught me so much about that. 
And I also want to thank you for getting me into radio once upon a time. Oh, it's, pleasure. Because <laughs> it's, it's been so much fun, uh, you know, over these nine and a half, pushing 10 years. We started in July of 2013, was it? 2012? I don't remember. I think you and I started in 2012. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 2012. Yeah. Yeah. 2012. Yeah. 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 So yeah. thanks, Sabrina. Oh, um, thank you, Chris. And thank you, everybody, for joining us here today. Thanks so much for tuning in today. If you'd like to empower yourself to step further into your vibration of change, please visit my website at christineupchurch.com, where you can learn more about my insights, upcoming events, and private sessions. Thank you.